Welcome everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I am the co-director of the festival. And we are in our 16th year of bringing authors and readers together. And this weekend is our biggest festival ever with over a hundred panelists joining us. So we have two full days of events. I'm sure you've all taken a look at our website since you needed to, to register for this, but you saw that there was so many events this weekend so many different topics, there's something for everyone. So I hope that you will be uh, signing up for some more over the next two days. We are using Zoom webinar, which means that you can see the panelists, but we cannot see or hear the audience. So we invite you to use the chat window to have any discussion that you'd like. But if you do have questions for our authors, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we will be taking questions and going through Q&A later in the session. I also want to thank A Mighty Blaze for partnering with us again this year. Uh, we are live streaming to their Facebook page. We uh, partnered with them last year as well, and they have always been a big supporter of the festival. So thank you to A Mighty Blaze. Uh, finally, for housekeeping, I want to remind you all uh, that local booksellers need our support now more than ever. Uh, this is Independent Bookstore Day, as a matter of fact, so uh, we hope that you'll consider buying your books uh, maybe from our partner, Independent Bookstores, which is Jabberwocky Bookshop here in Newburyport and also the Bookshop at Beverly Farms. Once we get started with the session, I will put links to those two bookshops in the chat window. But of course, if you have a favorite local independent bookstore, then we encourage you to shop from them as well. So to get started, I would like to introduce our authors. So Nancy Johnson worked for more than a decade as an Emmy nominated award winning television, television journalist. Her debut novel, The Kindest Lie, has been recognized by Elle magazine, The New York Post, Marie Claire, Good Housekeeping, The Chicago Tribune, and was featured on Entertainment Weekly's Must List. Nancy lives in downtown Chicago. And we also have Julie Carrick Dalton. Her debut novel, Waiting for the Night Song, has been named the most two most anticipated 2021 book lists by numerous platforms and was an Amazon editor's pick for best books of the month in January. She's the winner of the William Faulkner Literary Competition. She's a mom to four kids and two dogs and owns a small farm in rural New Hampshire. So welcome, Nancy and Julie. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Appreciate that, Jen. And so just want to say hello to everyone. And I'm so glad that you guys could join us. And I'm really honored to be here with my dear friend, Julie Carrick Dalton, who's my literary BFF. We have been on this journey together of writing and publishing the entire way. So I couldn't think of anyone else that I would rather be with um, for this particular talk. And Julie and I uh, both wanted to acknowledge uh, the moment that we're in right now as a country. It's been a very painful and traumatic week. Uh, we had the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. And then the very next day, the family of Dante Wright laid him to rest. And I know for so many of us, um, particularly those of us who are black and brown, when we look into the faces of George Floyd and Dante Wright, we see our fathers, uh, we see our sons, we see our brothers, we see our husbands, and some of us even see ourselves. Uh, and we are very broken as a country and we have so far to go. There's so much that we need to do work, important work that we need to do uh, in this country uh, when it comes to race. And that brings us to this conversation. We are going to talk about secrets in our novels, but we're also going to spend um, most of our time really speaking to the moment that we're in, whether it's race or climate change. Uh, and so my novel, The Kindest Lie, published February 2nd, and it is a story of family, sacrifice, and love at the dawn of the Obama era. And it tells the story of um, this unlikely friendship, unlikely connection between two people. One is Ruth Tuttle, a very successful Ivy League educated black engineer in Chicago. And she's on the come up, uh, but she's also searching for the son that she walked away from many years ago. And then she meets and forms this connection with this poor young white boy nicknamed Midnight. And he's adrift searching for his own sense of belonging. And the two of them meet in this dying Indiana factory town. And when they get together, they're on this collision course of race 
and class. And so that's what uh, the kindness lie is about. Again, speaking to the moment that we're in very timely with what's happening with race in America. And I have to say the same thing for you, Julie, that, you know, we are now in uh, Earth Week and Earth Month and your book, Waiting for the Night Song, is also very much in conversation with where we are right now. Thank you, Nancy. And um, you know, thank you for having me here today for at the festival. And I'm always happy to be in conversation with you, Nancy, because I feel like we talk a lot, but there's always something new that comes up when I talk with you, especially about our books. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book, um, Waiting for the Night Song came out in January. It's um, my debut novel came out from Forge Books, Macmillan. And at the core, it's a story about a fierce female friendship. It's about secrets and betrayal and redemption. But it's all set against the backdrop of this slowly changing climate in an agricultural town in New Hampshire. Um, and as Jen said in the introduction, I also own and operate a small farm in rural New Hampshire. And so a lot of the story is inspired by environmental and climate elements that, you know, that I witnessed on my farm or things that inspired me to ask questions. So the backdrop, the setting in my story is kind of the backdrop of my life on this farm in New Hampshire and things that are really speaking to me. And I think that a lot, I started writing this book 13 years ago and a lot of these climate and environmental elements in my story feel more pressing now than when I started writing this story. It feels like it was meant to come out in this moment. I feel like Nancy probably feels that way too that our books are coming out in, in the middle of a conversation that our country is having. Right now, you know, with, um, you know, it's Earth Week, we should be thinking these things all year, but right now it's in the media everywhere you turn. You know, our, our president, you know, Biden just announced, you know, new uh, initiatives for cutting carbon by 2030. And it feels like we're having a reckoning in, with climate as well as with race in our country right now. So I feel very fortunate to be able to have these conversations. In my book, my main character, Katie, is an entomologist. She is working for a forestry department, trying to prove that there is a looming environmental disaster coming, but she is has um, obstacles put in front of her by a climate denialist government. So she's trying to push and prove something that she believes in her heart to protect land that um, is meaningful to her and people who are meaning to, meaningful to her. But at the beginning of the book, this secret surfaces and you know that's kind of what brought Nancy and I together today is we want to talk about secrets in our book and the way they work as vehicles for storytelling and so in, I'm not going to be revealing any spoilers by telling you this but in my book and similar in Nancy's book we throw the secret at you right in the beginning in mine in the first chapter Nancy's I think is on the first page yeah. but in, in my book the, um, a, a literal secret surfaces it's a body and my character knows something about who this is and how this person got to be buried in the woods years ago. And she has to go home and confront this secret. And I, I'd love, you know, Nancy, we can, we can talk a little bit about why we chose to throw this out in the beginning. Because for me, it's not about what the secret is, but it's about why we they got to that moment and more importantly, what happened to the characters afterwards. So throwing that secret at the reader immediately instead of diffusing suspense, I think it builds suspense for the book because we want to know the why questions. I'm curious about how you yeah. feel about why you did that. Yeah, the, the very same reason, Julie. I mean, you said it. So like on the very first page um, of my book of The Kindness Lie, you find out that Ruth Tuttle convinced herself that her life began when she drove away from that little shotgun house in Indiana without her baby. She had only been 17. And that's in the very first paragraph. So you find out right away that that's the secret that Ruth had. And it's interesting, I was um, listening to an interview that uh, the author Britt Bennett did. She's the author of The Vanishing Half. And she was you know, delivering a session about writing. And she said she learned something from one of her professors who said that in writing novels, you build suspense, not by what you withhold, but with what you reveal. And hmm. so it's really about letting people know. And I was also inspired by Toni Morrison who wrote The Bluest Eye because in the very beginning of that book, you know, she tells us, you know, this is about a girl named Picola Breedlove who was molested as a child and had a baby by her father. And she said, that's what happened. She said, why it happened is too painful to talk about, but we're gonna talk about how we got there. And that's what I do with the kindest lie. You're gonna find out, okay, this woman left this baby behind, that's her big secret, but what are the ramifications of that secret? Not only on her, but on the lives of the other characters in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in, in our books, you know, Nancy's book and my book are very different in subject matter and tone and setting and writing and everything. But this 
element that we have this secret that draws our characters back to their hometowns to face up to their past and confront difficult conversations. And I think we have that in common and our characters have to go back and you know answer to their own past. And I think that you know that could also be a metaphor for what we're dealing with in our country. We're having to confront decisions we've made in our country or think decisions we haven't made and what are the impacts we're having. So, and I you know, think about your book, Nancy, you know, it's set in 2008, but I feel like you wrote this for right now. I feel like you wrote this for us to read and talk about now. How is it relevant? How would this story be relevant in 2021? Yeah, so many people ask me, you know, when I wrote this book, like, did you just write it <laughs> over the past few years? And it's like, no, no, I, you know, I started writing this book in 2013. But I agree, you know, it is so timely with where we are as a country. So I set the book in 2008, and that's when we had the rise of our first Black president. And then you look at where we are now, and we have just elected our first Black and South Asian vice president. Uh, you know, back then in 2008, we were going through the Great Recession. And then now we're in a global pandemic and people are losing their lives and their livelihoods. I mean, and so you've got this economic strain in both time periods, back then in 2008 and now. And I truly believe that this economic strain and tension exacerbates the racial uh, divide that we see in the country. So for sure, uh, and, of, and of course with race, um, you know, throughout the Obama presidency, we were dealing with issues of racism, racial violence, from Trayvon Martin to the Charleston, South Carolina church shooting, so many that I can't even go through all the hashtags. And then of course, right now with everything that we're dealing with, with um, uh, racial violence, a lot of it at the hands of law enforcement. And in your book, you make it very personal. You're, you're addressing a, a big topic, but you bring it to a personal level by these specific characters, by Ruth and Midnight, who we're really drawn to and we really care about them. So when you're telling the story, I'm engaged in what's happening to them, which brings me into this bigger conversation. So I'm kind of curious how you think, like, how do you believe novels like yours can advance the conversation about race in America? And what role does fiction play in advancing these conversations? Yeah, so like we were talking about, you know, years ago with 2008 and what was happening then, and then the comparison to where we are now. And then I look at 2020, look, just last year, when you had the murder of George Floyd, so many people were doing their anti-racism reading and a lot of that was nonfiction. And there was a, certainly a place for that, you know, when they were reading the books about white fragility and, and racism. But I think there's this power in fiction to really take us to a place um, where we can have empathy because we can fall into the characters. I think with the nonfiction, you have so much of that defensiveness. That's not about me, you know, I'm not racist. That couldn't be me. Um, but I think when you fall into the characters in the story, you're able to really understand and walk in the shoes of others and experience life through another character. And then when I have Ruth and Midnight, I mean, I've got these two characters who are so very different from each other, um, but yet they, they share something in common, common humanity as people. But, you know, with Ruth, she's very affluent um, and high in the socioeconomic uh, st stature, but at the same time, She's having a hard time getting promoted on the job and she's sitting in fear of a white police officer hassling a black boy on the L train. So she's still a black woman in America. And then you've got Midnight who's poor, lower socioeconomic background, but at the same time, Midnight is walking through Ganton, Indiana a lot more freely than his black and brown classmates and friends. And so I wanted to talk about some of those nuances of race and class in my book. And then in your book, Julie, you know, I know you talked about the fact that we are in um, Earth Week, you know, and that we have a president who's finally taking some of these issues of climate change very seriously and engaging in some of this work. And so I think, you know, your book too speaks to uh, the moment that we're in right now. And, you know, you set the book, Where Your Farm Is in New Hampshire. I can't wait to visit it someday. Actually. <laughs> I can't <laughs> so I've been wait to your either. place in Boston, but I haven't been to your farm in New Hampshire. And I definitely want to go there someday. And but most people wouldn't think of New Hampshire being on the front lines of the climate crisis. And so I'm just curious about why did you choose to talk about climate change and do it in New England? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a question a lot of people ask me because you, you don't think of New Hampshire as a place that's, you know, on fire or flooding or serious drought. Um, and I think that's exactly why it's a great place to start the conversation. Because in um, New Hampshire are like, as I, you know, I have the farm there. 
And our growing season in New Hampshire has gone up, it's been extended by 22 days in the past century because our summer, the average temperature in summer has gone up four degrees, which is disproportionate to the rest of the country. But nobody's running around in New Hampshire screaming climate change because it's been this slow burning incremental change over a century, but it does change a region and it changes people in a way that's so slow that they don't see it. Now my character, Katie, she comes home after decades. So to her, it does look different. Whereas if people have been there the whole time, they don't see the change. And so what I tried to do in the story is connect the way New Hampshire this insular little tiny town nestled in the mountains is connected to the rest of the world because I think it's easy to look at your community and think that's all there is to you know not see the way we're all connected and um, you know I think we most of us know at this point that in you know worldwide and in the United States the communities are most affected and affected first by climate change tend to be black and brown indigenous poor communities for a variety of reasons, for socioeconomic reasons, for um, lack of resources, for having been relegated to less desirable land, to ha not having mitigation, um, uh, climate mitigation opportunities. But in New Hampshire, you don't think about that. But there are really st um, stark lines that draw New Hampshire to other parts of the world. I take um, put a lot of work into drawing the lines between New Hampshire and deforestation and hurricanes in the Caribbean to US intervention in, in Central America in the 80s and the agricultural crisis that it caused then, which we're now feeling in our country today. And there, what I tried to do is take it, the conversation out of the silo, like climate change doesn't happen in silos. It doesn't happen in one place in one moment in time. They're all connected. So taking this little town in New Hampshire that might seem pretty stable and pointing out the ways it's connected to the rest of the world and how we're all in this together. Because I think if you can wake up in the morning and think, you know, I have water, I have food, I have relative security, climate crisis is not affecting me right now. The question should be, why isn't it affecting you right now? And who is it affecting? And how am I involved in that? And what is my role in that? And so my characters are having to confront that in the story that maybe there's their world isn't as stable as they think it is and forcing them to look at the rest of the world and how it's all connected to each other. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, I, I'm thinking now about what we, what we do in both of our books with characters who have a different point of view than the two of us might have <laughs> yeah. as we're writing our books. You know, we say we're writing a book and you don't have your own point of view, but of course we bring our own um, perspectives to our novels. And I'm thinking about in my book, The Kindest Lie, I've got Midnight's father, Butch Boyd, is a racist. Um, but, you know, I try not to judge him. You know, in my book, I try to say there are no heroes or villains. You know, he's somebody who's a racist, but also at the same time, he's a good father. He's a good man in a, in a certain sense. And, you know, he's lost his wife, he's lost his job. And so we begin to understand who he is as a character. And so then I think about your book and how there are characters in your book, even government officials who don't believe in climate change. And then I think in the real world, we have a, pre we have a president, President Trump, who you know, talked about, you know, hey, we solve it by just cleaning your forest floors. And, <laughs> and that's the only, that's, you know, that'll take care of it. Um, you know, but in your book, you've got characters who don't take climate change very seriously, or either they might be deniers. However, you don't seem to pass judgment on them. And I want to know about that choice of not passing judgment on these characters in your book. And also, how does that connect with real life and how you feel about people who don't yet accept climate change as being real? Yeah, so that, thank you for that. I, it, it's, a, it's a tough thing because it's really easy, especially with social media. You know, your, your social media feeds become this echo chamber of people who think the way you do. You know, I read articles that reinforce my own opinions. And um, in my book, there are characters, like, as you said, who there's a, you know, an administration that's cutting off environmental research on public lands and denying there's a problem. And then there are very real characters with faces and you know, speaking roles in the book. There are some firefighters that don't believe um, in climate change and make fun of Katie, of my main character who's a scientist, make fun of her for her beliefs. And it would be really easy to take these people in fiction and in our real lives and relegate them over there. They're wrong or they're uneducated or they're stupid or you know, they're selfish. Or they're... And if we do that, we're not gonna further the conversation. So while like, 
on a day-to-day -day basis, if I, in, if I meet someone who I know doesn't believe in climate science, it's frustrating. But if I cut off all those conversations, we wouldn't be furthering the conversation. And so in my book, there are these firefighters who aren't, you know, they make jokes like, well, a few more forest fires means job security for us. You know, they're like laughing at this idea of forest fires that were resulting from climate change. And I feel like if, if we can look at them just like you did as whole characters, that they have a role in this community and I leave room for them to be full people to make, you know, they're, they, they are engaging in their communities in positive ways as well. And I also leave room for hope that maybe they're gonna open their minds. I don't fix it in the end. I don't walk away with everybody all of a sudden believes everything is great. I leave room that maybe they will, but I try not to judge them because I think in, in real life, if we do that, if we only talk to the people who believe what we believe, we're not gonna um, move our closet forward. We're not gonna, you know, if more, the more people that talk about it, the better. And I'll tell you a quick example of this is, I had a, a book blogger recently wrote a review of my book and it started out pretty harsh. It said, I don't watch the news, I'm not interested in politics and I don't really care about climate change. And I was bracing myself, this is not gonna be a good review. And then she said, but I loved your characters, I loved your story. And because I cared what happened to them, by the end of the book, I cared about climate change. And that is the reason that to me right there was, um, that was the most meaningful thing anybody's ever written to, about my book, to be perfectly honest, because it, it changed someone's viewpoint a little bit. And so I think we can't rule anybody out, you know, in terms of race and talking about immigration or climate, we need to engage with people and talk to them um, instead of just pushing them over. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think there are so many people whose minds have been opened, I think, just from reading our books. And we hear that in the, you know, in the comments that we get uh, from readers that, they're seeing the world in new ways because they're doing it through fiction. I feel like there's something deceptive in a way about <laughs> the way fiction like a Trojan works. horse. <laughs> it kind of, yeah, it gets in there and works on you. And, you know, and it's not um, moralistic. And it's like, it's, it's something that you're, you're falling into the characters, um, you know. And I'm glad you had that Goodreads comment where they turned it around and said, but, you know, because I remember, I think I told you I had a Goodreads comment where, um, somebody said, I didn't read the book because I didn't vote for Obama and I'm not a socialist. And it was one of those did not finish. <laughs> and they didn't have that but. You know? <laughs> yeah, that but is so important. It it's a great so feeling. It, it and, is, I, it is. and I also think within your book, and I hope with my book too, that they, they don't feel like they're pushing an agenda. Like it's always about the story. It's about the characters and what's happening to them, the, the relationships and emotions, because you want your character and your readers to fall into the story and the world of your book and to care because they care about your characters. And I think that that's, you know, you know we've been talking a lot about the themes in our book, but I, I, I know for me, and I think for you, it's in the end, it's really about telling a compelling story and that's what invites empathy. That's so true. I didn't want to be didactic, you know, I mean, this isn't a treatise, you know, for me on race in America. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about race but I wanted it to be a story. I mean, it's a story yeah. about a woman um, with secrets uh, who is going back and making peace with her past yeah. and dealing with some things that she hasn't dealt with in a long time and getting to know um, her family again, getting to know her, her grandmother uh, as a human being and not, you know, with secrets, someone who's, who she gets to know and understand as someone who is not just a mother figure or a grandmother. And I think that happens for a lot of us, you know, our the people in our lives, our family members, we only know them in relation to us. And, and we don't think about the secrets that they have and the, the secrets that they've been keeping in their hearts for so many years that they've never let anybody else know about. And there's so many generational secrets as well. But yeah, I wanted to explore all of that. And that was what the story was about and the relationship between uh, Ruth and this poor young white boy named Midnight. And, and that's something that that people really can fall into those characters and understand the story. And then when they read the story and understand it, then they're also thinking about uh, race as well. And, um, and I think, I, I remember there was a reader um, or many readers who said, I didn't see race in your book. And there may have been people who for you also said, I don't you know, uh, see the climate change and some of those things, but I think they're there. You know? and, yeah. and you either, if you don't see it, maybe you don't wanna see it, but those yeah. issues are there you know, overriding everything and under the surface of all of it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I also want to say that the opening lines in Waiting for the Night Song are, truth hides in the fissures and the hollows, in the broken places and in the empty parts. 
It can be buried, crushed, or burnt, but the truth will always rise. And so that gets us to that, you know, back to what we were saying about secrets and how those secrets need to be confronted in our books. And so do you think that, you know, and we kind of talked about this a bit, but do you think that fiction can bring to the surface um, some of those things that we need to really address and confront in real life as readers, as people, uh, as well as a, as a country? Yeah, I do. And, and I, I see there are many books I've read that have made me see other things differently. And I hope that, you know, our books can do that. But I think that this idea of, you know, the truth rising is, an, it, you know, it's kind of a metaphor in our book and in our, our country right now. And I you know there's a, um, a good example of the way literature can kind of interact with real life that um, I don't remember exactly when it happened, but there was in a case in Virginia where some kids were vandalized um, a historically black schoolhouse. It was like a historic place and they put the swastikas and white power painted on it. And the judge in the case, instead of sentencing them to time, I think they, they had some form of a sentence as well, but part of their sentence was they had to read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou as part of their, you know, to help educate them to open their mind. And there was a judge in, in England a couple of years ago who did something similar. There was a hate crime incident. And part of the, the sentence for these young people was to read books that had, um, that confronted racism and talk to the judge about it. Because he was acknowledging that these conversations, when they're brought out into the light, you know, when the truth rises and we look at it and talk about it openly, you know, that's, that's when you know hearts change or you know we can change society but by burying all these secrets or these conversations that are hard conversations about race are difficult and it, but burying them just makes doesn't make them go away it makes them worse so i do think that this you know this idea of confronting our secrets like you know both of our characters Ruth and Katie the biggest secrets from their past bring them home and then they crack open and it opens up some really important conversations that we're having right now. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about the fact that you and I, Julie, we both wrote about really difficult things, really difficult topics. And I, and I think for both of us, whether it's climate change for you and race for me, these are issues that are very near and dear to our hearts and they're very close to us. And I guess I just wanna explore what that was like for us to write about issues that are so near and dear to us and what some of our fears were in writing these. And, I, and I'll go first that I think for me, um, you know, as a black person in America, I had a lot of fears uh, in writing about race because I didn't know how it would be taken. And most people think that I worried the most about, <clears throat> excuse me, the white gaze and how white readers would um, interact with it. But for me, it was also about the black community too. I wanted to know that when black readers engaged with the book that they would see themselves on the page and, and be proud when they read the book. Um, because for me as a kid, you know, I didn't see myself on the page. I didn't read a lot of books where I was represented. Um, and so, and I didn't even know that I didn't see myself. You know, I wasn't even yeah. cognizant of it, I think until I was an adult that I realized that that was happening. And so I think for me, I, I worried about that. You know, how will black readers take this? You know, because I have a Ruth who is a single mother, not a single mother. I mean, at the time she had the baby, she was a teen mother. Um, she was 17 years old. And am I perpetuating a stereotype of, you know, black teenage mothers? Uh, you know, Eli, her brother in the book is, an, is out of work. He's an auto worker. He's lost his job. And am I, and he doesn't have his kids. And so am I perpetuating this deadbeat dad image in writing that, eventually I had to get to the realization that I'm creating complex characters that do not represent all of what it means to be Black in America. There's no way that one story can do that. And I think I worried about it so much because of the things that you're seeing in the news right now. You know, we know that, that the image of people and how we are represented and perceived has so much to do with, at least for the Black community, how we're treated, how we're policed you know, and um, representation and all of that matters so much. And it's a life and death thing. And so that weighed um, so heavily on me in writing the book and talking about race um, because I wanted to be so sure that I was getting it right. And also I didn't want to demonize the white characters in the book either. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talked about, how I created Butch and tried to make 
him as complex as possible because I wanted people to come to the story believing that everybody's got a point and yeah. connecting with it. And so just curious for you and writing a book that's also very close to your heart because I do know your passion uh, around these issues. Did you have any um, of those kinds of fears in telling the story? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, getting the climate science right was really important to me. So I used some fictional license and um, I brought this, the mountain pine bark beetle is the beetle that my character is, is, um, is tracking and I bring it to New Hampshire. Now this beetle doesn't actually exist in New Hampshire yet. It's a real beetle that's caused a lot of devastation in, out west that's triggered a lot of the forest fires we've seen in the news. But I brought it to a place that doesn't exist. So I had to set the stage that would be appropriate for this beetle to exist. And I wanted so much to get the science right so that the rest of the story would feel right. But um, but in telling this whole story, you know, we didn't talk about this much today, but um, you know, there's a, another subplot in my book that has to do with immigration. And people have asked me why I included that in this story. And I kind of think I couldn't have written the story without it. There are this town in New Hampshire, there are migrant laborers there, some who have been there for a very long time, some who are very new. And I don't really feel like I can tell a climate story about that's, that's looking at a whole town at a whole community and not looking at all the people that it addressed. But I really worried about that. I, I'm a white woman from New England and there are characters in my book from El Salvador and they aren't, were not point of view characters and not the main characters, but they are very full characters. And their histories of why and how they came to the United States to this little town are very integral to the story and very much linked to climate and US intervention in Central America in, in the 80s. And I think that those lines are important because I don't think we can tease, I don't think we can tease immigration, race, and, and climate change completely apart from each other. Because you know, you hear activists say a lot, there's you know, no clim climate justice without racial justice, um, that, that they're, in, they're all intertwined. And so if, it, you know, if I had told a story about a town and not inclu included all the people who were actively and vibrantly part of this community and not and talked about how they were affected by the climate elements, it wouldn't be a true story. It would be a half story, but I worried about it. You know, I engaged um, several Latinx um, readers, sensitivity readers when I was writing it because I wanted to tell these, to in include these characters in a very full and meaningful way because I think that climate change, you know, as I mentioned, it doesn't exist in a box. It doesn't exist in a silo, it's part of all parts of our life. And I really wanted to show that it isn't just the farmers because the farms are being foreclosed on. It isn't just the firefighters. It's all of us in this tapestry together. And I think it's important to talk about it, but it, it did, it, it was hard. It was difficult for me to engage in that conversation. And people have challenged me on why did that storyline need to be in the book? But for me, like it could not be in the book. Yeah, they're so interconnected, I think. And in both of our books, and for me, it was race and class that are so intertwined with each other. There's no one way to be black in America. So that's why I was exploring, you know, someone who's upper middle class like Ruth. And then also going back to her hometown and seeing people who are part of that poor and working class community. But yet the black characters, no matter what their socioeconomic background, we're still dealing with racism in America, but sometimes just in, just in very different ways. And so there's definitely that interplay between the two and there's so much nuance and um, connection between the two. So um, this yeah. has been a really great I conversation, know. Julia, I think about both of our books, about secrets, and then just like we said, speaking to the moment um, that we are in right now. So Jen, thanks so much for having us. And um, we would love to entertain any questions or comments that have come in from the audience. Great. Um, yes, just a reminder to our audience. So if you have a question for Julie or for Nancy, please use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question that we have is from, um, I think she pronounces her name, Anissa. I, I apologize Anissa. if I don't. She's Anissa. She comes to all uh, of our friends. We love Anissa. <laughs> what is the best writing tip that you have received and you use daily in your writing day? Want to take that first, Nancy? No, I'll let you take that okay. first. Because I, I have so many and I'm like trying to think of the best. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, I the best writing advice I ever read was to recognize that your um, antagonist believes that they're the hero in their own version of the story. And that kind of goes back to Nancy's question about you know, the climate deniers and why, you know, and her characters that you know, might've been racist, giving them full humanity. But um, looking at the characters who might not be the hero of the story, 
but understanding that in their own mind, they are the hero. Every room they walk in, they are the main character of the story. And so when I was writing my book, I was having trouble with the antagonist in my story. And so um, he felt flat and he didn't feel like a full character when I was first writing. So I went back and wrote about three chapters from his point of view. I was never gonna use them, but I wanted to understand what was going through his head when these things, when he was doing things that appeared wrong. And by getting into his mind, I realized he was not really a bad guy. He was in a difficult situation and made a not great decision, but he wasn't a bad person and it really helped me write his character. So I would say, look at the characters who you think are like, you know, your bad characters mm -hmm. and pretend they're the hero and write a couple scenes as if they are the hero. And then you'll know that character better. Yep. Okay. So for, that was a good one, Julie. For me, I would say it's about, at least for the kind of books that I write, which are, you know, typically more family stories, um, relationship driven stories. And this was a piece of advice that I got from Tayari Jones when I uh, workshop with her at Ten House. And so I, so, you know, my story is, you know, about a woman named Ruth Tuttle who goes back to her hometown in Ganton, Indiana to confront her past. She hasn't seen her grandmother who raised her in many years. And so when she got back home, I had this scene when she first gets there that they were at odds with each other because there is some contention and I wanted to show that I had them, you know, yanking curtains and snatching ditch dishes out of each other's hands. And it was just very, you know, a little over the top and melodramatic, you know, in terms of how they were interacting when they first came back together. And Terry Jones told me, no, you stop all that snatching <laughs> and that yanking. We don't want any more of that. She said, what you need to do is show the connection and the love between these two people. That that is what's going to be important. Show that they love each other because she said that readers connect with characters they see loving and connecting with each other. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is so true. And I'm taking that into writing my second book, People of Means. Um, I'm thinking about when there is um, conflict, that the conflict is going to be so much stronger and richer when you have people who are already connected to each other. And it's the same thing in our real lives. I mean, imagine if you have a, a conflict or an argument with your mother or your husband or whomever, it means more and it's more pivotal and there are, there are higher stakes when you have those conflicts with the people you're closest to, as opposed to a conflict with a stranger, somebody on Goodreads, <laughs> you know? or, you know, or somebody you don't know. You know it's, it's just a so, totally different dynamic. And so thank you so much for that question, Anissa, and thank you for always supporting our events. Um, great, so we have another question um, from an anonymous attendee. Are you both utilizing flash fiction with the first paragraph to the story? Hmm. You broke up a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, sure. Uh, are you both utilizing flash fiction with the first paragraphs opening us to the story? So I, I think he's, uh, the, the question is, are, is, are you using flash fiction at the start of, of your books? Um, and that's an interesting question. I've never thought about it that way. But, you know, Nancy had read those opening lines of my book about, you know, the truth living in fissures and hollows and broken places and empty parts. And that is really um, kind of encapsulating where my story is going. And in the very end of my book, I repeat some of these lines from the first paragraph of my book that kind of bookends my story. And I think that I, I wasn't consciously doing that, but I do think the action that happens in the first paragraph of my story is almost an overview of where my whole book is going. So I didn't consciously think about it that way. And I do actually have written flash fiction. I really love flash fiction. I think it's a really powerful and you know concise way of writing. So I hadn't thought about it that way, but um, I might be thinking about that when I wrote, the, I'm working on a second book right now too called The Last Beekeeper. And I might be thinking about that now when I go back and look at the opening paragraph of my book. How about you, Nancy? Yeah, yeah, I would say the same thing for me. I hadn't thought about it as flash fiction either. I've done that in some writing workshops um, and I think it's a kind of an interesting um, exercise and getting words on the page and getting ideas out there quickly. Um, but yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. But like you, Julie, my beginning, my opening, um, I've opened the book with this celebration of uh, Obama being elected president. And, you know, the characters are having this celebratory mood and there's music and dance and, you know, it's a great mood. And I mirror that at the end. I'm not going to tell you how I end it, but <laughs> you also have um, a celebration uh, at the end of the book too, that where the feelings are really uh, mirrored uh, between beginning and end. And so it's kind of like they're bookending each other. 
I really love it when the end of a story can really almost, almost respond or answer the opening of a story. It feels really satisfying to me, whether it's a happy ending, an indecisive, a sad ending, that it some way harkens back to that original, you know, emotional moment in the beginning of the book. That yeah, you kind of I always like that. I love it too. Yeah. So we have a question from Anita Johnson. She says, hi, I'm a black female Southern writer. Question for Nancy, how do you work on building characters of other races, Latin, international, Asian, et cetera, outside of your personal experience? And she notes that Julie spoke a little bit about this earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, that was, um, that's a question I get a lot, you know, being a black author, First of all, I get a lot of questions from white writers who want to write black characters. And then, of course, I'm a black author who was writing um, in my book. I really the, the characters who are different from me in terms of race are white uh, in my book. Um, what I usually say to that is for one, and I, it'll be the same for you, Anita, you know, I believe that we have this unique perspective as black writers because we have lived our entire lives in white spaces you know, because we've lived in America. And, you know, so I think for me, I, you know, I'm fairly fluent in whiteness and in understanding that. Um, so I didn't have to do the kind of research that I think a white author would need to do in terms of writing black characters and being responsible and getting that right. Um, but at the same time, I didn't treat my white characters really any different um, when I was writing them as I did my black characters. I cared about them. And I think the one best compliment that I've gotten is that people say they can tell that I empathize with and care about all of the characters and the white characters as well, not just the black ones. And so Midnight, which is the white boy I wrote about, he's the one I felt the closest to, believe it or not. But what I did was it, it, beyond his whiteness, I looked at who is he, what is he going through emotionally? For me, it's all about emotion. And he's a kid who stands on the outside of things um, and is looking to belong. And as a kid, I was bullied quite a lot. And so I went back and I dug back into my past and how I felt. I know what it means to stand on the outside of things. I know what it is to be desperate, um, to be liked and to belong. And so I infused all of that into Midnight. And so I would say I need to do the very same thing um, with your characters, even your white ones. Um, make sure you're bringing real human emotions to them and spend time with them, getting to know them and imagining what they're feeling and what they're going through in each moment of the story. And I think that will make them well-rounded and complex and nuanced. And if they are, and if it is an experience that is very different from your own, like maybe Latinx or something, make sure you're talking to some of those folks, getting to know them, um, immersing yourself in that world, interviewing them. Uh, that's another thing that I'm very fond of doing, but we don't want to give short shrift to any of our characters. We want them all to be complex, fully rounded and nuanced. Um, so we have a question from Meg Moore. Um, she'd like to know what surprised you both the most about the, your experience as debut authors? Wow, I guess um, we can't avoid mentioning the pandemic because, um, you know, I know Nancy spent about six years writing her book and it took me 13 years to write mine. And, you know, and then the moment when we entered the world was in this world we couldn't possibly have envisioned. And I think that the, um, that scared us. And there was like you know, grief on my part of not being able to have a launch party and meet people in person or go to the Newburyport Literary Festival in person. But I found so much community and so much um, support and love from other writers in particular and readers like An Anissa who shows up and I don't know where she lives but I feel like I know her because she shows up to events and seems to care. And there's a lot of people like that, that, um, you know, booksellers, librarians, I can't, I can't thank them enough. I always joke that I'm going to go on a road trip and hug every bookseller and librarian that's <laughs> ever like talked about my book because I didn't get to do that in person. But I have found these communities all over the country that I wouldn't have met otherwise. So I think our debut moment, at least for me, will always be tied to the pandemic, but not entirely in a negative way because there was there are these silver linings all along the journey. And I feel it, for every person, every literary festival, every bookstore, every you know organization that lifts up, especially debut writers, because we don't have any name recognition, that the, um, the gratitude I feel, I, I don't know if it would have been the same you know, if it had been in person. So for me, it's just, I'm just eternally grateful to all these people who've been supporting us. Yeah, and I feel the very same way. It's been community. You stole my answer about Anissa. <laughs> 
and so many like her who are just avid readers who have connected with us and just the generosity of the literary community that has been uh, incredibly powerful. And also um, my friendship with Julie on this journey that has been um, one of the biggest blessings uh, of going through this, having someone to be with me through the highs and the lows of this journey. Uh, and so I just wanna thank uh, all of you for being here. Thank you to the Newburyport Literary Festival for having us and letting us share our stories. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for joining us. I, we do need to wrap up. I hate that there's one question here. So I'm gonna throw it out and we're gonna do it really fast. What other authors are you reading? So, so I guess if you can just give us a few authors to put on our TBR and then we're gonna to have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, I usually give Julie. Uh, <laughs> I did, I give Nancy. <laughs> yeah, um, we both have a mutual um, friend and great author, Sarah Penner, who wrote The Lost Apothecary on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, Denny S. Bryce, Wild Women in the Blues. Mm -hmm. Allison Hammer, who wrote Little Pieces of Me, which just released. Um, those are a few. Zakia Delilah Harris, who wrote, um, oh, Oh God, what is it? Um, the Other Black Girl. The Other Black Girl, that's one that just blew me away and it's coming out this summer. And I say that, you know, the top books I'm reading, I read a lot of books in the climate space and um, Charlotte McConaughey's Migrations was one that just blew me away. And she has a new book coming out this summer called Once There Were Wolves, which I'm so excited. And other like new debut authors that are putting climate stories out there, um, The Effort by Claire Holroyd. Um, it's a futuristic kind of cli-fi um, science fiction story with great relationships and characters. And, and then there's a romance novel called Shipped by Angie Hockman, also a debut author that is a, a romance enemies to lovers, Galapagos cruise stories that engage, engages climate change. So um, there's just a lot of exciting new voices coming out in this space. Wow. All right. I, I, I'm interested in all of those. So I'm glad I got to that question. <laughs> so thank you so much, Julie and Nancy for joining us. And thank you to our audience. Hopefully we're gonna see you at other events throughout the weekend. So for the Newburyport Literary Festival, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.